here, and, uh, and I'm excited about the text of Scripture that we're going to read from today. In my mind, uh, it is the most exciting chapter uh, besides the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This chapter that we're going to read, this section this morning, is the most exciting. It's, uh, it's about what happened right after the ascension and how people responded to the great rescue plan of God. It's in Acts chapter 2, if you want to turn over there. While you're doing that, I have a couple of announcements to make. The first one is, you, you'll see it on the board behind me. Um, coming up in April, we are putting together all new care groups. Uh, we're going to have eight care groups, and uh, you get to choose which one you're in. And uh, you can either uh, get together with your group one time every two months. We're going to have potluck lunch back there for that group. And so every other month, you'll have uh, potluck lunch with your group. Uh, you can also sign up for a group that meets once a month or one that meets twice a month or in a care group that, that meets just once every eight weeks but also does other things uh, during that two-month period of time uh, like other little Bible study groups or little service projects. So we'll have all that explained, but new groups are forming now. And uh, starting next week, we can start signing up ourselves. And uh, you can look to see who your friends are. You can sign up with them or who are the best cooks in church. And you can sign up with that group if you want to do that. Uh, so we're excited about that coming up soon. Be looking for more information on that. Uh, Heather is putting together this, this whole new system of keeping track with everybody. She's already got 600 names, more than 600 names, building the new church directory. And so you can actually go to an app that you can download on your phone. For all of you 40 years and younger, you'll know what I'm talking about. We can go to the app and you can change your information if you want. You can post a picture if you want. And we're going to build our own directory uh, in the next couple of months. So be looking at, on how to do that. You'll also have the ability to get help with that or to sign up just in paper form later on. So be looking for that. Um, on April the 4th, that's just about three weeks away, it's when the early church gathering that's uh, been 70 and 80 people strong recently, they're going to be in here uh, to worship with us. And we'll start worshiping as one congregation again on Easter Sunday. I'm excited about that. You guys excited about that? Um, what we're going to do, because there are quite a few that are still wearing masks and very concerned about their health, uh, we are going to do like those signs say over there, provide this area and this area as kind of a safety zone if, if they want to come and still be more isolated from everybody in the interaction, then uh, we're going to save these two. So you guys, you just lost your seat in the synagogue. <laughs> Sorry about that. For Easter Sunday, we'll see how that goes, and we'll still have these blue lines marking off the, the seats and all that, but the rest of them will be gone. I think we've learned how to do this safely, so we're excited to do that and to leave this area open for those that are more sensitive to, to that, um, the possibilities of that virus. Okay, let me see. Uh, church Center Direction coming up. The day before the 4th of April was the 3rd. See how smart I am today? That's the day we're having a special, uh, we're calling it Easter extravaganza. Now let me go here for just a second, okay? We know that Easter is just a, a made up holiday, but I think that a whole lot of people around the world are spending that Sunday thinking about rabbits and eggs, which I don't know how they go together. But a lot more people are thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we want to realize how the community is acting and responding to that weekend. So we planned on Saturday to have a special gathering. Whoever wants to, we're going to advertise it to the whole community and say, come on here to our property. We're going to have the Easter egg hunt. We're going to have special games for adults. Uh, little get to know you areas. We're even going to have lunch. Somebody's cooking lunch for everybody. And on that Saturday from 11 to 1, we're going to invite the whole community to come just to make connection with them. In preparation for that, Heather would like us to contribute candy to this effort. We're going to put little candies and little eggs and hide them for actually three, I think, different Easter egg hunt situations. So if you have a chance, stop by the store, pick up a little bag of candy, bring it, put it in the grocery cart back in the lobby. Um, that's before 
that Saturday. If you'll do that, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, let me see. A couple other things that didn't make the bulletin. Stan Riddell's mother passed away just a couple of days ago. So they're gone, or at least he's gone to Oklahoma. And uh, keep them in your prayers for sure. And here's the celebration point. Jared and Ramey Phillips had a baby girl named Jewel Avery just a couple days ago. So we're excited for them. That makes number three. And uh, no, so pray for them. They've got their hands full for sure. So we'll celebrate with them when we see them next. Whew, okay, now all that's left is for me to offer the invitation. So if you have reason to respond, please come while we stand and sing. Or, like one fellow said, one preacher, great preacher, he said, listen, I got everybody to respond at my last sermon. Well, I said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I just said the words. If you have e any reason to respond, will you stand while we sing? And everybody stood up. And he's like, man, this is a great sermon. I'll do that one again. I'm not going to do the sermon today to be impressed uh, by, by you. I'm going to read from you, uh, excuse me, for you, what happened in Acts chapter 2 after the apostles were told to wait. Jesus had ascended. He had gone up, and he said, just hold on. They didn't know how long, but they were in the upper room waiting, just waiting. They didn't know how long, but they said, we remember what he said. We remember that he said, I'm going to send a comforter for you. Until I leave, I, I'm going to send another comforter. Like he was the first, the second half of God's story was about to come. And when he comes, you'll receive power from on high to do some incredible things. It was going to be worth waiting on. In our society, if you didn't know this, most of you will wait in line for six months during the course of your life. I mean, I was pretty frustrated waiting 45 seconds to get my receipt for the oil change I had done last week. I had to wait 45 <laughs> seconds. These guys waited 10 days, 10 nights for this thing to happen. Now, here are some scriptures beforehand to kind of tell you what was going on in their mind. It was 50 days after Passover to Pentecost. And John 7, 39 said this, no one will have the Holy Spirit from God until Jesus had gone back into heaven. And then in Luke chapter 24, it says, Jesus had, uh, Jesus had promised the apostles that the Holy Spirit would come and give them power from on high. John 14, Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would Remind the apostles, keep that in your mind, of all that he had taught them while he was with them. You see, they'd walked around with him for, let's see, three years, listening to him teach, seeing his miracles, seeing the character of God in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is going to remind the apostles of what he taught them. And finally, in Acts chapter 1, 8, we read that last week, his apostles would receive the Holy Spirit and be witnesses for Jesus throughout the known world. Now, when I say the known world, I'm going to show you a slide in a second and tell you where that was, but just hang on. The scriptures are more important than the stuff that I'll say on the side. So here's the first passage we're going to read. Read it for yourself, Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. It goes, excuse me, yeah, it goes something like this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Talk about the apostles. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Can you imagine sitting there as, as one of the twelve and realizing this is it? This is what we're waiting on. And all of a sudden, it appears after the roof is shaken and the walls are shaken and the big glowing ball, we imagine, ball of fire comes and then it splits up and it goes and it lands on each of the apostles. Okay, so this symbol, my hand, is going to appear to you as a tongue. I gave a devotional talk for junior high kids one time about the taming of the tongue to, to be careful what you say. And I brought a real cow tongue and I had them pass it around in class. They loved that class. And I left the slobber on it so they would have a lasting appearance of that on their hands. 
imagine a cow tongue or even a large human tongue above their heads. Now, we say it was like fire. What scripture said it wasn't really fire, but it looked like fire. Much like when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. It said it didn't descend in the form of a dove. But we get the idea when everybody paints a dove in that picture, and that's okay. But in this case, it looked like fire, but it was just a tongue over their head. Maybe a glowing red tongue over their head. And they're looking around the room. And Peter is looking at Andrew, James, and John. He's like, look at that thing over your head. What is that thing over your head? And, and then they're looking back at him. They're kind of chuckling. You've got one too, Peter. What is that about? And then they begin to speak in these languages that they had not studied. And they're all just amazed at what happened. They're excited about the Holy Spirit being able to do incredible things through them. And, and that spills the excitement of them in the upper room. Spills out into the courtyard and people start coming. Now, there were people from all over that were in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost, from all over the known world. And they came and they were saying, what are these guys doing? They're teaching in languages they hadn't studied. We're going to read this section next and exactly what happened next. Here's what they had in mind. And you need to remember, in Luke chapter 24, the audience was the apostles. It wasn't everybody getting the tongue over their head. It was the apostles. In John chapter 14, when Jesus was talking to that group, it was the apostles. In Acts chapter 2, the audience was the apostles saying, these things are going to come and you're going to get power from on high. The comforter is going to be with you. It's just the apostles. And then in 243, right after this, uh, the people were in awe of the works done through the apostles. See, this is where a lot of our Christian groups around the world get a little bit confused. Because they think everybody should have the ability to have the tongue on their head and do miracles. That's the Holy Spirit. They would say they're, they're, they're mistaken. The 11, or now 12, now that they've replaced uh, Judas with Matthias, now they're 12 in Acts chapter 2, 12 apostles. In Acts 5, 12, a little bit later, uh, the miracles were done by the apostles. Same story, same 12 guys doing the miracles, speaking in languages they, they had not studied. Here is the map of the places where people were from that were in Jerusalem for the Pentecost. You see all those places? This was kind of known as the known world at that time. And all these Jewish folks had come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost. And this is where this exciting thing happened. Now, Acts chapter 2, 8 through 10. We're going to read that section next. So, so go, out, go back to your book. Now, let's, let's back up to verse 5 and start, yeah, let's do 5 through 13, just for the fun of it, because it's the scriptures, it's God's word, let's do it. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That means they had all gathered from the region. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them, that's the apostles, 12, speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? So that clearly says that not everybody was speaking in some kind of a language. It was just the apostles because they were the ones that were the Galileans. Verse 8, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own language? Now stop right there. Typically, when Pentecost happened, you had different language groups that would gather up and do these certain rituals, and they would have somebody from their group do it because they spoke the same language as that group that had come from Rome. Maybe they're speaking Greek from, from, from the Roman perspective. Here's what's going on. Maybe they're speaking Swahili from Africa. There are two places in Africa mentioned, and maybe they were having a, the same kind of Pentecost talk in, in Swahili. But this day... All the apostles could speak in each one of those languages. And if you look at these groups, this listed here, now I have to think Luke had some idea to say, let me tell you clearly how many people were there, how many language groups were there, because it makes sense. Listen to this. There were 12 language groups there. And it just so happened a couple of years, three years before this, 
Jesus happened to, by chance, choose that there would be 12 apostles. You kind of see how that fits? Somehow he knew that those 12 language groups would be in Jerusalem. And so Jesus didn't choose three apostles or seven apostles. He chose 12 because there were going to be 12 language groups at Pentecost. I mean, this day is the day that God's been waiting on and that the people have been waiting on for hundreds of years. Let's keep reading. Here's, here's the names of the groups. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Perga, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, that, that, those are Gentiles that have become Jews, uh, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them, apostles, telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking and said, they are filled with new wine. I know that, that Andrew probably sat up and said, what? You think we're filled with new wine? You think we're drunk? We don't even drink. It's just like, you know, I don't get that. Why are you making that up? This is the day that you've heard of. You remember. How is it that each of us here in our own native language, here's that group, 12 languages they were all hearing and then verse 36 through 41 is the rest of the story now imagine this it says peter stood up with the 11. in that day in that culture when a religious teacher in the area of the temple or in the temple courts when one teacher stood up it was always to read the scriptures first and what everybody else did, they set out. Now we have this scene where the scripture says, Peter stood up with the 11. Peter's standing over here, and he's talking to that group in, let's say, Greek. And then Andrew is standing, talking to that group in whatever that language group that is. James has got a group. John has got a group. Peter and James, John. Philip's got a group. Thomas got a group. Thomas. Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, the rest of them, the 12. Everybody's got a group. And they're teaching the exact same thing. Luke is over in the corner. Luke's the physician that writes the book of Luke and write, at, writes Acts. He's over in the corner. He's taking notes of what Peter's saying. Peter stood up with the 11, and here's what Peter was preaching, which was the same story exactly that the rest of them were speaking. And then Peter starts to tell the whole story of Jesus Christ saying, Jesus Christ, he, he's the Messiah. A and he actually backs it up a little bit and says, you remember this prophet Joel? Joel told about this day when we would be able to do these miraculous things and speak in these languages. Joel prophesied about it. It's in your book, people. That's what he's saying to the Jewish folks. It's in your book. You know the story. You know the prophet. And David, David, King David, he, he's in your book too. And he prophesied about this day coming. Not only would a king be on the throne of David, but that he would be ascending and then the power would come to the apostles. Okay, I'm about to have a heart attack up here. I'm going so fast. Let me slow down the train just a little bit. This is the day that the people of God have been waiting on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is the sermon that Christ and the Holy Spirit told these 12 apostles to preach. When this day of Pentecost comes, when you get power from on high, when you can speak a language miraculously that you've never studied, here is what I want you to preach. And he told the story of Jesus Christ. And let's read the rest of the story. This is Acts chapter 2, 36 through 41. Let all the house of Israel know, therefore, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. I'm looking at my notes. Joel 2 said his covenant, this day is happening. Jesus the Messiah said he's the, he's the Savior. 
That's what Peter was saying. The rest of the apostles were saying. And then he said, you killed God's Messiah. Put yourself in that audience for just a second. You know what happened to Jesus. You know that he was slaughtered. And they said, but wait a minute. We've seen him. You've seen him for 40 days. He was talking to us and teaching us about the kingdom and all other kind of stuff. You know it happened. You know you murdered him. How, mm, how in the world are they going to get by that? And then he said this. God, but God raised him up. You murdered him. You killed him. But God raised him up. Your forefather David said, David said this would happen. By the way, that's also in your book. So Peter and the rest of the apostles are to ask the same question at the same time. In my book, at least, they ask the same question at the same time. You killed him. And the people all said to their teacher, one of the apostles, what shall we do? And every single one of the apostles, because this is what Christ taught, this is what the Holy Spirit reminded them of, they said this. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To this point, there was really no way for them to have total forgiveness of sins except through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah that would come, who would be that sacrificial lamb. Until this point, people did not have total forgiveness of sins. They would sacrifice their animals, if you're of Jewish faith, and hope to make it through the next year until you could sacrifice another one. And to cover some of those sins. And then hopefully make it through the next year without sinning. And it didn't happen. But you have to do another one. But once and for all. Jesus was sacrificed. For the sins of the world. And here's what happened. That day. Uh oh. We're going backwards. That day. 3,000 people. Said I'm in. And when they meant. They're in. They meant. They're not just in the water being baptized, but they're in on this rescue. They're in saying, I need rescuing. It's about time, and I am ready to jump in the water. I'll do the nasty plunge. I'll do whatever you want me to do because I know my sin. 3,000 people that day were being baptized and added to the church. By God, added them to the church. I cannot imagine Peter trying to baptize 3,000 by himself. I can only imagine the 12 guys were baptizing. And then I can imagine those people who were baptized turn around and baptizing somebody. It was a mass breakout of baptism. Just a couple of years ago in the, the country of Rwanda in Africa, 10,000 people were baptized in one day. I don't know their Christian background, what they were taught exactly, but I do know that all of them were following what Christ said and what the Holy Spirit said and what the apostles said was necessary for forgiveness of sins. What it really means is I get it. I understand who Christ was, and I know about the death and burial and resurrection, and I want to die to myself and be buried like he was and then rise to a new life. 3,000 people and it was time and everybody had waited but it was time for God to break through the clouds to break through the roof of that house to shake the walls in the process and say today everybody's going to be taught how to be sin free and there's only one way. And if you're not baptized into Christ after you see these things and you remember who Christ is and what he did for, does for you, then you are outside of the fellowship of God's people. But if you say, I want forgiveness of sins and I want the Holy Spirit indwelling in me, then come to the water. Come to salvation. When Christ said the Spirit would come, the guys didn't really know what that meant. 
But on this day, they figured it out. And it applied to everybody. Now you'll see soon that people were baptized. They didn't get up and do miracles. In fact, chapter 2, verse 34 says that, and 512 says that. It was still the apostles. You see, the Holy Spirit came in special ways for a few people with that tongue of fire on their head and their ability to speak in languages and their ability to do miracles. And that's how the Holy Spirit would come on the apostles. But on everyone else who would be born again that day and ever since, God said, we're going to do something even more important than this. We're going to let the Holy Spirit live inside of people for the first time in history. It may shake up your world a little bit when you realize that because the Holy Spirit, God living inside you, will make some changes. And they're going to be good changes. They're going to be blessed changes. They're going to be changes that will give you a better life now and an eternal life. He's actually the guarantee of an eternal life, Ephesians says. But when the Holy Spirit came into these people, the world was set on fire because of the changes in their life. And so more important than the miracles of that day done by the Holy Spirit was the Spirit of God and the ability for that spirit to move in to people's lives. Whew. I hope I didn't go too fast or too long. But when you really understand that that's where it all began, the Holy Spirit was worth waiting on. But now, the Holy Spirit may be waiting on you to give your life to Jesus Christ so that he can move in and bless you eternally. Don't keep him waiting if you need to become part of God's family. Let's pray. Holy Father, such a beautiful, clear story of that day of Pentecost when so many people said I need to be rescued from my sin and to be given hope for my life thank you father for that miraculous day but the miraculous things you're going to do and have done in our lives because we let the spirit move in father thank you for that gift thank you for showing us clearly how people responded to the offering of that gift. And Father, if there are some in this audience, even in this listening audience, that want to respond appropriately to the gift offered through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness, and then the Spirit moving in, let them do that today or as soon as possible so we won't keep the Spirit waiting. Thank you for breaking through into our lives. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. God bless you today, church. Let's stand. Sing a song together. We lift our voices. We lift our hands. We lift our